This is Metro Week. Our top story, efforts to improve business relationships at the Arizona-Mexico border. We'll hear what's working and what's next. Then we review the week's news with our Journalists Roundtable. If you um, go back in Tucson's history, trade with Mexico, uh, you wouldn't even have called it trade with Mexico, you'd have just have called it trade. I'm Andrea Kelly. Mexico has the 14th largest economy in the world, and economists predict it will jump to fifth by 2050. Yet Arizona is not among the top three states for trade with Mexico. That's why Tucson is increasing efforts to strengthen business relations with Sonora. Fernanda Echavarri brings us the story. Government and business leaders in Mexico and the U.S. say both countries benefit from thinking about Arizona and Sonora as one economic region. One of those government officials is Ramón Guzmán Muñoz, the mayor of Nogales, Sonora. Nosotros tenemos un concepto muy bien definido de lo que es eh, el ser amigo, el ser socios, estar delimitado en una, una línea, el que tengamos familiares aquí y allá. Somos, somos prácticamente un mismo estado, o dos estados, pero con un solo corazón. Esa es la realidad en todos los aspectos. Yo lo veo muy bien. Last year, 9.5 million people crossed into the United States at ports of entry in Arizona. And Guzman Muñoz says both countries must learn how to do business with each other. At a recent conference in Tucson, business leaders and government officials from Sonora and Arizona talked about immigration, customs, highways and transportation and how both states can learn to conduct cross-border business more successfully. Juan Padres is an economic development specialist for the city of Tucson. He focuses on helping both countries understand each other. I grew up in the border, so I understand both cultures uh, very, very well. I know how to do business in Mexico and I know how to do business in the U.S. So part of my job is to bridge that gap. He does that across many industries in Sonora. There's, it's a hodgepodge of, of, of what we're seeing. We see everything from a very, very small business owner who has a very limited production that wants to enter the U.S. market to huge manufacturing. So you, we, we go to both sides of the scale and everything in between. The number of commercial trucks crossing the U.S. border here is up 3 percent to about 312,000 a year. That means wear and tear on the roads in both countries, man hours to regulate the flow and workers to load and unload the cargo. Sonora's economy has grown by about 6 percent, with its largest growth in the aerospace, mining and automotive industries. Many in southern Arizona's business community want Tucson to be the logistics hub for cross-border commerce and trade. Certainly we're in the younger state, we're in the growing stages right now. There's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be put in place, but uh, uh, we are catching up. Uh, this is something we probably, Tucson, should have been doing 25, 30 years ago because just of our strategic location. But um, once we start putting all those assets in place and we start building all that infrastructure and we start announcing to the world, really everybody outside of Tucson, that we're open for business, uh, Tucson can take advantage of it tremendously. He says Tucson's future is in trade and logistics. People laugh, or some people might disagree with me when I say that this could potentially become another little Long Beach. But when you start putting all these assets together of a seaport just four hours away from us, an east-west link on the rail, and you have a very good uh, lines of communication in I-8, I-10, I-19, and then you have two major, three major airports surrounding Tucson that could potentially all interlink with all these other assets. Logistics are a critical part of doing business between two countries, as are cultural matters. Padre says there are other unspoken rules that vary between two cultures. If I would have to say what, what is the biggest challenge so far, and it is the cultural differences. So you have a lot of Mexican business owners who don't really speak English, who don't understand our laws, and it's, it's intimidating. Um, you know, it's, it's intimidating to go from one country to another, speak a different language, a different way of doing business, different laws, different, uh, different accounting rules. It's, it's, uh, it's intimidating. Business owners in the U.S. experience similar intimidation. You know, there, there's a lot of companies who have a lot of interest in going to Mexico. They understand that there is a huge potential and opportunity to do business. But when, when we invite them and say, hey, let's go down to Guaymas to check out a few clients, a possible facility, oh, well, you know, 
uh, again, it's a different language, it's a different culture, there are certain perceptions on both sides of the border, whether it is uh, crime in Mexico or whether it's SB 1070 in Arizona. If you do need translation Tucson Mayor Jonathan Rothschild says Arizona has felt the effects of such legislation. He has traveled to Mexico multiple times since he took office and says the state's economy could benefit from an increase in trade between the two countries. He says a good start is bringing back international flights to the Tucson International Airport. We hope and believe that by late fall we will have a, a direct flight, a non-stop flight, from Tucson to Hermosillo. And that's critical because once you go to Hermosillo, Hermosillo is a hub for the rest of Mexico. So you can go to anywhere in Mexico from Hermosillo. And that is important to us. In 2013, trade between Arizona and Mexico totaled $14 billion, split evenly between imports and exports. Still, Rothschild says Arizona could improve its trade rankings with Mexico. When you break it down by state, uh, California is number one and Texas is number two and that makes some sense because California the, you're trading into the Pacific Rim and Texas you're trading into the Midwest and the eastern part of the United States. Right now Illinois and Michigan are ahead of us and, and that's just something that we can improve on and correct and use as a basis for building our own local economy. Now here in the studio with me is Gonzalo Avila. He is chairman-elect of the Fresh Produce Association of the Americas and works in Nogales, Arizona with other produce importers. Thanks for coming up for this interview. Thank you for having me. So first let's start, what does the Fresh Produce Association of the Americas do? We represent a community of uh, produce companies in Nogales, Arizona. Um, some mostly importing uh, companies that import produce and some that uh, buy and sell produce uh, throughout North America. And you represent those companies to whom? We represent them within our industry, um, uh, whether it's at the state level or at the uh, federal level. Um, we do work in, in Phoenix, we do work in Washington, um, trying to uh, stay on top of the issues that we face in the produce industry and making sure we're well represented. So what's something you're working on right now? Um, for example, one of the big projects we've had uh, actually for the last couple of years is we are getting ready to um, officially open up a new port mm -hmm. that went into construction about two and a half years ago. Um, Two hundred million dollars were um, invested in this new Mariposa port down in Ogallis um, and we believe it's understaffed um, by customs so we've been lobbying to try to get more customs officers and recently 170 of the 500 customs officers that we've been requesting were uh, granted to the state, out of which 120 were assigned to our port. So you, by your estimates, are still more than 300 officers short of what your goal would be at that new port? That's right, that's right. And the idea is, since we now have the infrastructure, um, it's, it's not being you know, used to its maximum capacity if we don't have the people staffing it. Um, we want to make sure that the security in the port stays the way it's always been, very tight, um, not allowing things through the port that aren't supposed to come across, but all the legal trade we want to come across as efficiently as possible. Um, it's been already a, a big improvement to what we had before this, but we think it can get a lot better. Okay, so even being short, you've seen improvements. It's been better getting those trucks through, trucks full of produce in your cases. For sure, for sure. We, we had, before the, the expansion, we had four lanes open. Um, during the expansion, it went to eight, even though it wasn't finished. So, and, and we will continue to have eight now with the new port. So we've doubled the capacity, basically. Um, we, we import about 1,500 trucks per day during the heavy peak uh, part of the season, and the new port now has the capacity to handle up to 4,000 trucks a day. So to be able to increase uh, trade through this corridor, we need to staff, staff our port. So tell me about how, how you do that job. Um, how do you represent the produce companies in Nogales to 
the Tucson City Council or the Arizona Legislature or Congress? It's really just making people aware um, of what, in our case, the produce industry in Nogales represents for the state and for the country. Um, during our produce season, we import approximately $3 billion worth of produce. So the economic impact is very big. And we are now competing with other ports in other states um, to try to keep and grow the produce that comes across through this port. So we have made it our mission to inform um, our state legislature and our representatives in Washington because we have people that represent us and we ourselves go and our staff go on a continuous basis to Phoenix and Washington to inform them of what our industry does uh, and what our needs are and it's, it's given us good results. So based on that work and you've been working in the produce industry, compare the business climate now to say 10 years ago. Are things getting better, staying the same, getting worse? Um, I would say they're getting better. Okay. They're definitely getting better. Uh, our, our average times to get a truck across the border used to be well over an hour. They're down to about 45 minutes. Um, we'd obviously like to get that down even, even to less time. Uh, we have very experienced people at the port, uh, whether it's customs uh, officers from FDA, uh, customs, USDA. So with, there's a good community down there that understands produce. And the, and the reason I say it is because we work with very perishable products. Mm -hmm. So unlike, you know, moving dry goods, you need to have experienced people who know what they're doing. So you get the product across, it's efficient. It's not a product that was supposed to cross today and crosses the next day. And then it, you know, it diminishes the, the, the shelf value, the commercial value of the product. So it has gotten better. What kind of issues are on the horizon? Uh, what are you going to be working on that helps continue to improve the business climate for you? There's two, I think, things that are related to this. One is from the port, which we call the Mariposa port, to I-19, we're working on trying to get a direct lane mm. that would mean no stoplights, no traffic lights, um, for safety and for efficiency within the city of Nogales. So it would get produce from the, from the border, direct to I-19, to where the warehouse uh, terminal area is, where most of our warehouses are. Uh, that's one. The other thing is I-15, which would connect Nogales to Canada, basically, mm -hmm. and create a new trade corridor, would be great to also um, increase the amount of produce that we cross through Nogales. And you're working on those, it sounds like those are federal issues, federal highway type of issues. The, the first one is ADOT, and they have it in their plans. The state in their five-year plan. Yes, yeah, state transportation, right. Great. Thank you so much for coming in and uh, telling us a little about the industry. You're welcome. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lorraine Rivera. Join me next for Arizona Week as a retired four-star general weighs in on the U.S. military efforts in Iraq. This is a problem for the locals to solve themselves. Get with it. Form a government in Baghdad, as they're trying to do. And we're back with our Journalist Roundtable. Joining me this week is Tim Steller of the Arizona Daily Star, Zach Ziegler from Arizona Public Media, and Jim Ninsel of the Tucson Weekly. Thank you all for coming in. Zach, let's start with you. You attended the Border Business Conference with Fernanda Echavarri. What were some of the specifics you heard from people there about what they want to happen to help increase the cross-border business relationships? You know, Juan Padres really summed it up pretty well when he talked about some of the issues as far as people are concerned about logistical, legal issues. They wonder about how cultural things will work. They worry about the language barrier. They wonder about where they're going to be heading, how things are going to be different, they really kind of seem to need that calming voice walking them through it. Uh, when I was working on some companion radio pieces that we aired earlier, I really kind of heard about a, a successful company that did this in Airtronics, uh, an aerospace parts company. And they actually worked with a third party company who had experience getting shops set up in Maquila Doris, uh, the duty-free, tax-free zones for trade and manufacturing. And where is Airtronics? Uh, Airtronics is located here in Tucson. Been here for 40 years and now for about the last uh, five months, I believe, they have had a factory in Nogales, Sonora. 
And Tim, you've been covering the business community in Southern Arizona for years. Is this a new issue or a new conversation that's happening? No, uh, I think maybe what's new is the need to rekindle the relationship. Uh, if you um, go back in Tucson's history, trade with Mexico, uh, you wouldn't even have called it trade with Mexico. You'd have just have called it trade because that's basically where all the trade was happening between Tucson and the mining communities and that sort of thing. Um, over the decades, uh, the relationship has ebbed and flowed, and, and there was a real ebb um, maybe in the late 2000s around the time of the recession, uh, passage of SB 1070. And now we've rediscovered that this is an advantage we have, that is our location with respect to Mexico and our relationships. And so now people are pushing really hard again to, to make the relationship uh, strong. And Zach, you talked about maybe some of the concerns people have. Did you hear specifics about how to solve those or how to get over some of those issues? Uh, the main one that I heard about is just communication, open lines of communication, finding the right people that have this information. You know, if it's a legal question, who's your best uh, legal minds, lawyers who can answer these questions? If it's a cultural question, how to get set up with someone maybe on the other side of the border who can help you out? figuring out how to get those factories established and things along those lines. It, it really is just that talking to the right people and knowing who the right people are, that knowledge. And Tim, what sense do you have about the potential for increased impact, economic impact in Southern Arizona if this relationship is fostered and developed as people mm -hmm. seem to want? Well, as Fernanda's piece pointed out, uh, our main advantage is our location. Uh, big city north of a major uh, manufacturing and, and trade corridor, and now with the potential of having um, containers coming up from Wymus now that it's a deep sea port. Uh, so the business of logistics at its fa uh, fa um, warehouses, distribution centers, et cetera, is, is, has big potential here. Uh, also, there's the visitor relationship where people come up from Sinaloa, Sonora, and other places to shop here. You see that all the time, of course, in the in the winter or Christmas time uh, when people are shopping, but also throughout the year. And basically, as uh, Mexico's middle class grows, Mexico's uh, buying power grows, uh, that, that helps us in terms of the retail sales. Are these seen as two separate issues, the retail sales versus the business development? I think there are two parts of the same uh, issue. I mean, it's, it's one big relationship. Uh, they, they maybe thrive on different dynamics. Mexico's economy maybe uh, determines the number of visitors and, and, uh, and whether they can buy a lot here. And Jim, let's talk a little bit about the Congressional District 1 race here in Southern Arizona. It dips into Northern Pima County. We heard this week that Adam Quasman, one of the Republicans running in that race, uh, says he was diagnosed with cancer about a year ago. It's a slow progressing blood cancer that's not uh, anticipated to affect his health very much in the next several years. Um, he says he announced it this week because people have started asking him questions about his health. Is that really all there is to the timing here? Well, that's a good question. I mean, we certainly uh, don't wish cancer upon anybody. Sad story that Adam Quasman is suffering from cancer, but there are a lot of people out there questioning the timing of this because people had been asking this question of it apparently for some time, and he chose to do it two weeks before the election, perhaps trying to change the defining moment for Adam Quasman from uh, identifying a bus of YMCA campers as uh, migrant children and, and looking very foolish and ending up on the Colbert Report to a uh, more sympathetic picture of him. Uh, he's had a lot of trouble in the fundraising arena. He has not uh, really performed very well on that front, and it's a real problem, I think, for him going forward. He doesn't have much money in the bank here as the election comes closer. Uh, this is a really difficult district. You mentioned it dips into northern Pima County, but it also goes up the eastern rural half of the state up into northern Arizona. Very difficult to get a message out in that area via television, as, as you, un unlike the, the CD2 down here, uh, you really have to depend on mailers and radio and things of that nature because uh, television ads just don't work as well. And without the money to send out those mailers, you're handicapped for sure. Yeah, I would be... Um somewhat surprised if it was uh, done for political advantage. It just, uh, I don't see the advantage, especially of waiting till a good number of voters, a good percentage of voters have already cast their ballots in the Republican race. And, uh, you know, anything might happen in politics, but it, it just seems far-fetched to me that um, Adam would do that.
Jim, let's talk a little bit more about the numbers in that race. Uh, we're starting to see the fundraising numbers for the last report that we get before the primary. And uh, I have to look at my notes a little bit. Ke uh, Gary Keeney, the Republican in the race, one of the Republicans in that primary, raised about $118,000, but 100000 of that he gave himself. And we've seen that in every cycle. Uh, Andy Tobin raised about $50,000 in the last several weeks. And Adam Quasman raised about $30,000, but gave himself $10,000. So we're seeing here not even $99,000 those candidates raised, not even $100,000 combined uh, if you take out the money they gave themselves. What does that say setting up those can whichever candidate wins for heading into the general? Well, Ann Kirkpatrick has more than a million dollars on hand. She's the Democrat who already represents the district, so she's going to have a colossal advantage over whoever comes out of this primary. It, it's clear that all of them are having trouble raising significant amounts of money. This was a shorter reporting period, just July and, a, and, and the start of August, so it's not the typical three months. It's a pre-primary period, but still there are some real uh, significant Significant fundraising challenges facing all of these guys. Uh, I, I suspect that if you see Andy Tobin come out of this race, though, you'll have a lot of independent expenditures on his side. The uh, National Republican Congressional Committee will certainly be weighing in. I don't know that the other two can really count on that. Could it be that just maybe there's a lot of people right now waiting to kind of jump on the bandwagon of whoever comes out of this ahead? Maybe they don't see a real clear winner, at least not enough to their liking, and they're just saving their money basically for the race to beat Kirkpatrick? I, I think it's more than that uh, because all of these guys would love to have more money and they need the money to be able to communicate with voters in a district that's this spread out. I, I don't think any of them would be particularly happy with it. You know, it's Keeney self-funding a lot of his campaign. I'm sure if uh, he could get that money elsewhere, he'd be happy to be getting it. So I, I think it's not so much people are waiting to see who comes out of it. Although I, I think the independent expenditure committees are probably waiting because uh, I think the, the problem, to, Tobin's whole uh, approach at this point is to point out that he's the serious candidate in this race. He's not the guy who's been on the Colbert Report as Quasman has been. He's not the guy who uh, has uh, <clears throat> been mocked in other ways as Gary Keeney has when he sent it, mentioned that 99% of mass shooters were Democrats. There, he hasn't made slip-ups of that nature. So uh, I, I think it, it's it should really, in a normal year, this would be Andy Tobin's race to lose, but these are not normal times in Republican primaries. Switching to a, a central Tucson topic, Tim, you've been writing a lot this week about Rio Nuevo and the, the plans to use some of the land on the west side of downtown and the prospect of using that land and the, and the questions up in the air about how to use it. Bring us up to speed on what's happening with the Rio Nuevo decision on that right now. All right. Uh, the Rio Nuevo district owns 8.5 acres of land. It's uh, land, if you've been downtown, uh, along I-10. Uh, between the convention center, or more specifically, between the federal court and the interstate, it's a strip, uh, north-south strip of land. And on the east on the side, east side of, right of the interstate, yeah. right. So it's an important entryway, the gateway to downtown Tucson. And um, two developers have proposed, um, answered a request for proposals and proposed buying the property and then de doing a development there. The Rio Nuevo district is picking between them by scoring their proposals. Initially, they had scored the written proposals a couple of months ago. Um, <clears throat> Alan Norville's uh, Nor Generations proposal scored slightly higher than uh, Ron Schwabe's Peach Properties proposal. Uh, this, then the board decided not just to rely on the written proposals, but also to have a, a, an oral presentation. And so each group did an oral presentation this week, which will also be scored uh, by Monday by each of the board members. And they'll total those scores, and whoever has the highest point total gets the right to negotiate with the Rio Nuevo district. Do we have any idea what the specifics of those proposals were? Retail oh, yeah. versus an arena, things like that? Yeah, the arena idea is out. Um, each of them is uh, estimated to cost more than $100 million. I think the, the components that uh, are required are uh, residential development, most importantly a hotel, uh, retail, and uh, parking. Um, uh, Alan Norville owns an adjacent property and wants to build an, an exhibition hall there uh, for the GEM show and other TCC events. Uh, each proposal has those components. However, Norville's uh, contains a proposal for a visual arts center, uh, which uh, would be a real different idea. The details of it were a bit sketchy uh, and um, not much residential. Uh, 96 units is what they propose, whereas Schwabi's proposal talks uh, speaks of 300 plus mm -hmm. units of residential. So that's a really key difference in their two proposals. Jim, is this a 
evidence of indecision by the Rio Nuevo board, or are they just taking due consideration, due time to make the right decision? Hard to say, but I think at one point the city of Tucson controlled this property until the Rio Nuevo district and the city of Tucson worked out their agreements, and at that point Schwabe's uh, pr pr uh, process uh, proposal was moving forward and so there may be some legal concerns about what the city has done there as if, if uh, I believe that's how it went down right? yeah yeah it's uh, it's not looking good right now in terms of the um, the outcome Monday will occur but then uh, there are various grounds that each side is already developing for protesting the uh, outcome and uh, Schwabi already has a legal claim with the city which would now go against the um, Rio Nuevo district if he chooses to pursue a lawsuit. So the, uh, unfortunately, Rio Nuevo is passed as a litigious uh, kind of bogged down uh, entity may continue with this project. And Zach, and another topic this week, Tucson Electric Power. We just found out that the sale was finalized, uh, sale to another com company. What does that mean for ratepayers? Uh, yeah, Fortis, a Canadian-owned utility company, is now going to be taking over UNS Energy, UNS owns TEP uh, as well as Unisource Gas, which provides uh, natural gas throughout a large portion of uh, Yavapai, Coconino, and, uh, and the White Mountains. So throughout a nice chunk of the cold part of Arizona, uh, the final sale went down for about four and a half billion dollars. That includes two billion dollars in debt that UNS had. Uh, what it's going to mean for people locally here as well as in the areas where they get uh, UNS gas is a small rate reduction for some of the colder months of the year. I believe it's October through March for the next five years. Folks can expect to see an acquisition credit, they're calling it. It'll discount your bill about a dollar, uh, not too much. And then uh, from there, we'll kind of see how things go. Uh, but the folks at TEP are saying, we're not going to raise our rates. We're not going to change anything about how we do business. What's been remarkable to me about this is uh, several years ago, uh, a private equity firm, um, KKR, tried to buy uh, Tucson Electric Power, a Unisource, and it was just an incredibly hostile uh, situation. It was um, uh, uh, would have made uh, Unisource a private company. Um, it had been publicly traded. And eventually, the Arizona Corporation Commission rejected the buyout as, as uh, being too uh, dangerous for uh, customers. That is, it could, there were too many uncertainties. Whereas this raised um, very few objections and uh, went through quite smoothly. Speaking of the Corporation Commission, which oversees the utilities and regulates them, Zach, you've been covering that race in the Republican primary, and we've seen APS, Arizona Public Service, weighing in on that or having a role in that race. Is Tucson Electric Power? doing anything in that race so far? Uh, not really. The big matter that it's all alleged at this point and said to be dark money that APS is getting involved trying to uh, have an effect on how solar is presented for electricity, particularly residential solar. Uh, that has been their big involvement or what people are saying. It's all once again alleged and not proven. Uh, APS themselves it will neither really confirm nor deny what is going on with that. Uh, but it looks like TEP hasn't gotten involved to this point, and TEP uh, in particular hasn't had the interest in uh, some of the areas as far as getting a surcharge for rooftop solar, which has been a concern for APS. And they really seem to just not be uh, as concerned with rooftop solar. Yeah, I think uh, I think APS is really working the refs in this case and trying to choose their own regulators. If if indeed these uh, allegations of dark money are true, and and if they're not denying it, I think it's a pretty good sign they probably are true. Uh, and they have definitely backed the slate of of Forsey and and Little in this race, and uh, are taking uh, a lot of damage from that up in Phoenix on the airwaves uh, as as uh, those two candidates are being portrayed as you know the lap dogs of uh, APS up there. We don't see too much that on the TV screens down here, but it's probably pretty damaging to their campaigns. Certainly, uh, Lucy Mason and Vernon Parker are seen as the candidates who would be much more supportive of the growing solar industry here, which APS seems to be pretty determined to, if, if not completely squash, at least remove any kind of economic incentive of getting those rooftop solar panels on individual customers' houses.
We should add that those four names you mentioned, those are the four candidates running in the Republican primary for Corporation Commission. Two of them will move on to the general election. Correct. That's all we have time for this week, you guys. Thank you for coming in. Uh, for more information on these and other stories, including those that air on NPR 89.1, go to our website. Now, Arizona Week, a retired Army general analyzes the United States' involvement in Iraq. I'll see you next week.